Chapter 7. Askedi is both the city and the very world itself, named after the first king who conquered the world in the first epoch. King Hebar is a, is a direct descendant of King Askedia. The city of Askedia, however, is one of the few places in the world that is not ruled by a kingship. <coughs> Norman is to leave for this city tomorrow to try to help save his former employer. As night falls upon the, upon, upon the burial woods, the same pass that Norman and Lancaster traveled to Murick on, Samson walks with heavy step just off the road against the thick forest edge. Vandalized tombs everywhere as he passes. He stops and as his vision narrows ahead to see two bandits raping a woman and a child in a cage. He slowly and quietly reaches for a small throwing axe and right as one of them sees him, the axe is lodged and embedded in one of the bandits' head, heads on the side. Caked in blood, the bandit falls to the ground dead. The other one scrambles to fasten his pants back and escapes off into the only path through the woods Samson has seen. Right outside of it is a small campfire in a cage and a black steed waiting around near the site used by the bandit. Samson runs up to the dead bandit and takes from him the throwing axe. He helps the woman up, dirty from being on the ground. He then hands her a satchel full of gold and says, This should help. I suggest you take this and buy a horse in the closest town away from Murick, okay? Where is my son? The woman looks around, trying to use the light from the small fire. A plea comes from the cage, and the young, and the young boy asks, Mommy, is that you? Samson scratches his head and insists, you two best be off. More may come. Of course, said the woman, picking up the boy and gripping him to her chest and running then stops. Wait, do you have a torch? She says as she walks back. Yes, here. Take this and light it from the campfire. It won't last the whole way, though. If you see bandits, put it out. The two run off the opposite direction of Murick, making sounds of desperation. The next day, Samson reaches reaches Silverstone. As guards look him over with adoration, one says, You look tough. Samson smiles and looks down, then back up and continues on foot to the inn as the sun has just come up. Even so, he is tired, very tired. He gave most of his gold to the woman and child in need, but still has plenty of what Norman gave him. Plus, he had been saving up from his pay as a high post guard captain. He swings the swinging doors open to the inn and orders an ale, feeling conservative today with the beer. Samson is in, in a serious mood that he has never been in before, as he realizes that his town has a chance to be saved from the dark hands that have moved and shaked it for so long. It is here that he hopes to rally others to his cause of bringing down dark and once and for all. Meanwhile in Escadia, Lancaster is still in prison there at the Tempest Guild, a large guild of priests and wizards who monitor magic since the laws of magic were passed, limiting its uses in the world. The world is just now accepting magic as an important, when responsibly used, practical thing, White Wizard. These laws are in place for a reason. We cannot have anarchy, says one of the guild members to Lancaster as he sits in the cell his hands holding the bars and sitting on, the, on a bedroll mat moved close to the bars. This room is enchanted far beyond your capabilities, wizard. You can't escape now, the man says with an almost guilty attitude. I had no choice, priest. Don't you understand that? I was fighting dark and not some fool. He would have killed me had I not outsmarted him. The priest walks up and grabs one of the bars and looks Lancaster in the eyes. Tomorrow you go before the council. They will decide your fate. Forbidden magic is forbidden, and that means it comes with the consequences. Now get some rest, Lancaster. Cr get some rest. Lancaster crawls on his knees and slides the bedroll into the back and lays down, his head facing and looking at the room. He closes his eyes and lets out a long sigh. Tomorrow he will either be locked up in White Tower as an apostate mage, or be branded a witch, or worse. He is not looking forward to the trial. He, however, is ready.
By night, water is heard dripping from some hidden place, and the muffled voices of others can be heard through the walls and doors. <laughs> Laughter and conversation is heard, and a candle flickers. Out from the air appears Lancaster's imp. Lancaster gets up quickly and almost yells, but then whispers, Boy, am I glad to see you. The imp snickers and says, Those silly laws don't affect me, Master. Ha! Lancaster then says, Keep it down, you tiny fool, and get me out of here. If anything, I'm starving to death and need water. The imp frowns and says, Sorry, sir, the room is enchanted by a very powerful ward. My magic won't work in here, well except for my invisibility. Lancaster lightly bangs one of the bars. The imp shakes and says, I have an idea, though. See those shackles over there? They are enchanted, too, to nullify any magic-wielding wearer. The fact that they have not put them on put them on you suggests hubris, or perhaps they are waiting until tomorrow when they move you to take you to court. I will simply hide them somewhere safe so they can't. Lancaster snaps his finger. Brilliant. Do that, then. Hope has come over Lancaster as, as he and his familiar hatch a plan through the night, a plan where no one gets hurt, his favorite kind of plan. Lancaster sits cross-legged in his cell, waiting for his imp's plan to come to fruition. Morning has come, and the guild members open the door and come in. Just as, just as one of them places their hand on the lock to open it, the magic dampening cuffs in their arm. Lancaster's imp appears and slaps them on the guild member. Just as that happens, the imp spills ethereal ink all over the cuffs and then casts a spell to blast the enchantment off the building as a wave of force is felt and seen. As the imp disappears, Lancaster looks at the member who spoke with him and says, This is the last time, I assure you. Lancaster, in the blink of an eye, disappears, teleporting off out of, out of the prison structure. The entire Tempest Guild scramble to find him, but the one Lancaster spoke to, which seems to be, seems to be the leader, no need, he is gone. Return to whatever you were doing. Let the fool go. Lancaster teleports in the highest chamber of White Tower and waves his hand, activating all his magic equipment. An assistant of his greets him. Bring me bread and water, boy. Bread and water. Of course, says the man. I am getting too old for this. I truly am too old for this. Too old. Of course, sir. The assistant bows his head and turns around to fetch food and water. A few moments later, he returns with bread, fruits, and wine on a platter. Ah, very good. Thank you. Lancaster thinks about all that has transpired and sits in a chair tucked in a mirror table. He rests his head upon his elbows and thinks to himself, Maybe I should just stay here from now on. Well fed, he feels energy once again and does not desire sleep. He simply gazes into the mirror. He hears a tap on his window. It is a messenger bird. He sees a note tied to its leg and gently takes it off and reads it. It reads, Lancaster, you have been sentenced to life in White Tower as an apostate wizard. If you leave White Tower for any reason, a bounty of exorbitant amount will be placed on your head, and you will surely meet your end. You may use this messenger bird for your needs. I recommend you give your riches away to help the common good. Tempest Guild.